Hey guys, Dr. McLean here. And this past weekend, I went and watched my daughter's ballet recital. And she's been doing ballet for about four or five years now. And it's really, really neat to watch her progress through the stages. And typically at these recitals, they have the littlest girls go first. They're three, four, or five years old, all the way up to the high school girls. And this time they did this a little bit different. They had the littlest girls go, and then intermixed between these girls, they would have some of the older girls go, and they would do a, a, a solo performance. And it was really neat. I mean, these girls are really talented. And so you, you have these little girls, these three or four or five year olds that really can't do much yet. They're just learning the basics and they might do a couple moves and then they get caught up in the moment. They look around or looking for their parents. And so they're just, they're very beginning stages. And then you see these high school girls, these 16, 17, 18 year olds that can go up on their toes and hold their body in these amazing positions. And they've really trained themselves over the years. And, but when I started thinking about it, you start thinking about these girls start when they're three, four, five years old, and they might only do half hour, 45 minutes a week. And as they get older, they do a little more time-wise. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, over 10, 12, 14 years, it, it, it's a lot of time, but it's it's little bits of time built up over time. And the why, why I'm telling you this is because what we do with our brains is we overestimate how much that we can accomplish in a week but we way underestimate how much we can accomplish in a month or six months or a year. And so oftentimes there's things that we want to do in our lives, certain skills that we want to develop or, or things that we want to do. And it's just too overwhelming for our brains. So we never get started. Like, well, I'd really like to learn how to play the guitar, play the piano or whatever goal or skill that you might like to develop. And so we don't even try because it's too overwhelming for our brain. But if you think about it that way, what if, what if all you did was do, you know, 15 minutes a day or an hour a day or even an hour a week, but then you do that for the next 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, how good you would get at that particular skill. And it's so fun to watch somebody that's just a master at ballet or piano or anything, any skill that you can imagine. So just want to encourage you that whatever you want to develop in your life, that you don't have to know everything, just start. So a lot of times we think about a staircase when we think about the very top step being your goal and when we think about the whole staircase. And instead of that, think about just what is the first step? What's the very first thing you have to do? Don't worry about anything else, just like the very first step that you have to do. And if you're not sure what that is, just guess. I'm like, well, I think the very first thing I need to do is uh, maybe find a piano instructor or maybe I need to find free piano lessons online if you wanna learn how to play the piano. But then you just start stacking those things. You do a little bit each day and you can master that skill. So break it down, but just don't even worry about the whole process. Just start with the first step and you'll be able to create things that will be just really amazing for your life. Hey guys, Dr. McLean here. And you know, sometimes when you hear some of these statistics in the news about cancer and asthma and diabetes and pretty much all the diseases across the board are, are going through the roof, it can be depressing, obviously. And, and a lot of times people ask me, well, why is that? Why are these cancer rates and, and heart disease rates, those things going through the roof? And why do some people get them and other people don't? And there's various different reasons for that. I want to break it down for you a little bit. One thing I'll tell you though, just so you're not misled on the statistics, a lot of times I'll talk about these cancer rates and they'll say, you know, such and such, the cure rate for such and such cancer is going down. So some people say, well, you know, we've got a lot of cancer, but at least they've advanced the technology and people are, are getting cured at a higher rate. But really it's a little bit of misleading statistics. It's actually the five year survival rate. So people are dying at the exact same rate and actually more of a, a higher rate, but they're surviving longer. Now, obviously any, any time you can buy, so to speak, is great, but it's a little bit of a misleading factor that we're not curing anything. We're curing we're people and keep people alive longer with medicine, but we're not curing them or they're not curing them. So keep that in mind. But we think about a bridge, you know, sometimes you get out in these smaller bridges out in the country and it says, you know, there's a certain limit, a, a ton limit on those things. And if you've got, um, you know, a certain rate on there, once you crossed over a threshold, just one more extra pound would cause that bridge to collapse when it, when it exceeded its maximum. So we think about that with our health, our bodies are amazingly adaptable. And we think about our current environments today with Wi-Fi signals and the fact that we're more sedentary, spending more time at computers and being inundated with negative news, so it's emotional stress. And then we add into that our processed foods and our sugar. So 
kind of like that bridge. It can, it can withstand so much, so much, so much, then it breaks down. And it's the same thing with our health. Our health can handle a lot of stress. We can handle being a little bit sedentary for a little while. And we can handle some of these processed foods and these sugars for a little while. And we can handle some emotional stress for a little while. But when we start to combine all these things together and they start to stack and stack and stack on top of each other, that's where we cross over that threshold and we get cancer, heart disease, or one of these horrible things. So we want to do what we can. You know, there's certain things we can't avoid in our environments. But we can, number one, minimize our exposure, number one. And it's not about being perfect. It's about advancing our body's ability to adapt with these things. We want to increase our body's ability to adapt. We do that two different ways is to minimize, bring down some of these stresses. And you have to look at your particular life and, and figure out what those things are. And then increase our body's ability to adapt. So maybe instead of being at the computer for an hour at a time, you take breaks. You only go 20 minutes at a time. That's going to increase your body's ability to adapt a little bit. It's bringing down the stress a little bit. Maybe you change your lifestyle and you switch a job so you can spend more time away from the computer and more time interaction with, interacting with people face to face. Um, increase your exercise. Maybe you're not exercising at all right now. Maybe you just start to increase to 15 minutes per day. That's going to increase your body's ability to adapt, to handle more physical stress. So you look at these little things, you just figure out what they are in your life. Minimize one thing, drop one thing down, even just a little bit, and then raise something else by again increasing your exercise, getting adjusted. One of the very best, simplest things you can do is getting your spine adjusted. That's going to majorly increase your adaptation. So think about it as the big picture and you'll increase your body's ability to adapt and avoid these diseases. Hey guys, Dr. McClain. Let me share with you the fascinating story of how chiropractic came to be. If you haven't heard this story before, but Dee Dee Palmer was the founder of chiropractic. He was a magnetic healer and a researcher in Davenport, Iowa at the time, 1895, this took place. And um, he was always doing research and trying to improve his healing efforts. And he had this janitor that was in his office and he talked to him and he was cleaning his office. And he was asking him and, and the, the janitor kept asking him to repeat himself. His name was Harvey Lilliard, the janitor. And Dee Palmer finally asked me, you know, why are you so hard of hearing? He said, you know, one day I bent over and my, I felt this kind of pop in my neck. And ever since then, I haven't been able to hear out of this ear. So Dee Dee thought that was really interesting. He started doing some research on this and found out the nerves that connected to the ear. And he, and he said, over time, he said, you know, can I check your neck? And he felt his neck and he could feel this bump. It felt like a, a bone was shifted out of alignment and somehow convinced Harvey Lillard to do the very first adjustment. He said he, he adjusted him and Harvey Lillard stood up and he could hear the uh, the horses on the on the streets outside the window again. This is 1895, so that's how chiropractic was found to be. And so Dee Dee Palmer initially thought he had found the cure for deafness, and so all these people started to come to him that had deafness and started getting their spine adjusted. And a lot of these people had their hearing restored, but a lot of them didn't have their hearing restored. And he thought, well, what is the deal or what I found? But a lot of people that were deaf that didn't have their hearing restored had other ailments that went away. And so over time, what he, did, what he found, we developed this philosophy of chiropractic is that found that, that our bodies are self-healing and self-regulating. Now, if the spine is shifted out of alignment, there's interference in that healing and the body can't heal the way that it's supposed to. Now, how did chiropractic kind of shift into back pain, neck pain? Well, what happens in, is in the, uh, the 70s, I believe it was, we got chiropractic, got insurance acceptance long before I ever practiced, which means that insurance started to pay for back pain. So what a chiropractor started to talk about, well, back pain. And this is where society as a whole really thinks about chiropractic being with back pain. And we work on the back, so that would kind of make sense, but that really has nothing to do with chiropractic. And I, again, same thing, a lot of people come in with back pain and the majority of the time their back pain goes away, but also other things will, will go away. Their vision will improve, their hearing will improve, or heart disease or asthma, these different diseases that they had going on also went away, not because I treated that particular symptom, but because we're moving interference. So, I really encourage you to look at chiropractic as a lifestyle, to use our, our medical paradigm as more of crises or emergency medicine, and thank God that we have that. But you don't want to rely on that for your health. If you look at the research, it really doesn't work that well uh, in any capacity as far as improving your health and maintaining health. And look at chiropractic as improving your body's ability to heal, it's self-healing and self-regulating. And Dee Dee Palmer said, your body doesn't need any help it just needs no interference. The problem is today, what do we do? We massively interfere 
with this inner intelligence of our body through Wi-Fi signals, through processed foods, through sitting in cars and using computers and all things that we shouldn't be doing to our body, but really hard to avoid in our current environment. So you want to do the best that you can to minimize those things and then get your spine regularly adjusted to remove that interference so all that potential can come through because your brain is where that inborn wisdom is stored. It's communicated through our body, through our nervous system that has to run through our spine. So that's why we don't treat symptoms or diseases. It's about removing the interference that power can flow out to every cell, tissue, and organ of your body. And that's why chiropractic is so powerful. Not because of me or any other chiropractor out there, but the intelligence that's inside your body, we just release it so that potential can come through. Hey guys, Dr. McLean here. We're moving into the summer season, which can be fun, especially in Montana. We went through a long winter. We had a really long winter this past winter. And I want you to think about your health as you come into the summer because there's some things that are benefits. We tend to be a little more active because it's warmer out. We get outside and do some more things, which is great. But we also tend to increase some certain stressful things with um, drinking. You know, it's a really nice day. It's really nice to have a nice glass of beer or we go camping. We tend to eat uh, more sugary and processed foods, or we go on vacations and things like that. So we want to enjoy those things, but we don't want those things to stack on top of each other. So for example, when I was in um, high school, I can remember my dad was, he was getting, gaining a little bit of weight and he wanted to lose some weight. And so he did it the wrong way. He did it by cutting calories. So he would, you know, wouldn't eat breakfast, then he'd eat a really small lunch, then he'd eat a sensible dinner, and then he'd get in front of the TV at night and he'd start eating Oreo cookies. And he'd say, I, I just can't figure out why I can't lose weight. But he'd be eating 10, 12, 14, 15 real cookies at one sitting or ice cream or whatever the dessert was. And he was just watching TV, didn't even realize he was shoving these things into our mouth. And so he did, you know, most of the day he was doing great. But then he'd have this little bit of time where he'd put all this sugar into his body. And that would offset all the other stuff that he did. So my point is, is that we might do three or four or five days of great stuff during the week. And then on the weekends, we go camping and we, we destroy it all. And so it doesn't mean we can't go camping and enjoy those things, but you want to stack some things up. So a couple little tips I'd recommend for you. One is exercise. Get into a good exercise routine, but one of the best things you can do is to exercise on the weekend. Sometimes we exercise Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday, and we take the weekend off, but then we tend to add these sugary foods on the weekend. So if you can get up and exercise on the weekends as well, it increases your body's ability to adapt to this increased sugar, number one. But also, it tends to keep our momentum. When you're working out, you don't crave that sugary stuff as much. It also keeps our momentum going. So if we only exercise Monday through Thursday, we have three days of um, less movement and more sugar, kind of kicks our butt. And on Monday, we're trying to recover versus just keeping that momentum going. So exercising through the weekend is really going to help you. And then with your foods, if you're going camping or going to parties or things like that, try to get some good food in first. So, you know, if you're going to have a hamburger and french fries, have a good, healthy salad first or add some vegetables to that. Or, you know, when I go camping, I really like to bring shakes with me so at least I can get a good breakfast. And even if I'm going to have bad food the rest of the day or have some drinks of alcohol, things like that, that I get a good breakfast and at least gives me a good foundation. I've got at least one good meal in for the day. And then let's say if you're lunch, again, if you're going to have bad food, add some good healthy stuff on top of it. But the biggest thing is you just want to have a plan because it can really build up. So it's not just the one weekend of camping. It's just not the other weekend of camping. It's the 4th of July, Memorial Day. And all these things really stack on top of each other. So you want to really look at the big picture. It doesn't mean, again, you can't enjoy yourself, but you don't want to, by the end of the summer, be totally derailed and be off track of the things that you're trying to accomplish with your health. Hey guys, it's Dr. McLean. Let's talk about heart disease and high blood pressures. Heart disease is one of the leading causes of death in our country, uh, maybe two or three, depending on which research you look at. And when we look at blood pressure, blood pressure is the amount of pressure against our blood vessels. And when we have high blood pressure, it causes the heart to work harder and it can lead to heart disease and stroke and heart attacks and, and all sorts of issues. So we don't want to have long-term high blood pressure. Now, the problem is the way that we look at high blood pressure. So if you've ever heard that statement before, change the way that you look at things and the things that you look at will change. So I want to hopefully shift your perception just a little bit here in how we look at heart disease and, and high blood pressure. So number one, we have high blood pressure. 
the medical or pharmaceutical slant is that, hey, you've got high blood pressure, let's take a medication to bring that blood pressure down. Now, logically, that makes sense. We don't want to have high blood pressure. But we have to look at what is causing that high blood pressure in the first place. The innate, inborn wisdom of our body is much more intelligent than our conscious thinking. And what I mean by that is that our blood pressure is raised up as a response to something. Now, it could be poor diet. It could be stress-related. It could be a lack of activity. So let's just take a lack of activity. If we're not getting our oxygen levels up on a regular basis, our, our heart says, hey, we've got to get more oxygen to the tissues, and therefore let's raise the blood pressure up so we can move the blood to the tissues quicker. That's actually a good response for that situation. Now, the solution would be to increase our activity levels instead of, again, taking medication to bring this blood pressure down. Now, if these medications didn't have any side effects, that would be fine, but unfortunately they do. The other thing is we're interfering with that innate intelligence of the body. If we say, hey, um, we're having a lack of activity, your body says, hey, we need to get more oxygen to the tissues, and it raises the blood pressure, then you come in and you say, I'm gonna take this medication and bring the blood pressure down. What do you think your innate, inborn wisdom of your body says? It says, what the heck, and it fights to try to bring that blood pressure up, and this is one of the reasons we get these side effects. We're working against what our body's naturally trying to do. So number one, you want to look at, okay, what is causing the problem? And, and I always, to, in my opinion, I, I'd rather see somebody off of a medication and have a slightly higher blood pressure than be on the medication, be within a quote-unquote normal range. By the way, who decided the normal range for blood pressure? You know, it's an average. There's no such thing as normal. There's an average, but you're not average. I'm not average. So we want that to be decided by our innate intelligence for our body. So we want to look at those things that might cause high blood pressure, a lack of activity, stress, poor diet, things like that, and try to bring those things down. Now, if you're in a crisis situation, your blood pressure is through the roof and you might have a stroke, yes, take the medication short term. And that's what I would recommend. Um, you know, listen to your medical doctor on that approach. But long term, you still have to look at well, why is it sky high and let's handle that situation so that long term you don't have to remain on those medications and continue to interfere with the innate intelligence of the body. But that's just a good general theme to look at is, what is the cause of the problem? What do I have to do to bring that cause down, remove that cause, and increase the healing of my body? So even if you're on a medication short term, still look at and explore what the causes might be and work on those things. Hello guys, it's Dr. McLean. I want to talk to you today about anti-aging. You know, as we reach a certain age, we're all looking for the proverbial fountain of youth. And to my knowledge, it hasn't been found yet. But there are some dramatic things that you can do to slow down, sometimes even reverse the aging process in certain parts of your body and in your body as a whole. So one thing I want to look at, it sounds very obvious, but it's a shift in your mindset and looking at removing the things that are going to increase the aging of your body and adding in more things that are gonna increase the healing and slowing down the aging of your body. So, for example, let's take sugar for example. Sugar is very pervasive in our culture. It's in almost every processed food that we eat. It's in a lot of the drinks that we drink as well. And sugar increases inflammation. If we just look at one aspect, sugar increases inflammation, which increases the aging and speeds up the aging of the joints of our body, the blood vessels, every different part of our body. So if we can reduce sugar, it's gonna give us an advantage. So if we look at, let's say, just sugary drinks, lattes and fruit drinks and juices and um, alcoholic drinks, which a lot of times have a lot of sugar. If you were to reduce or eliminate even one of those things and replace that with water, then that is gonna massively slow down the aging process for your body. Now, if you just do this for a week or two, it's going to be beneficial, but if you do that every single day for the next year, or five years, or 10 years. It's like compound interest on money. It's dramatic, dramatic results. And you don't have to be perfect, but if you just pick one or two areas and eliminate those things and replace those with water, it's gonna have a dramatic impact. Uh, if we look at the joints, the way that your joints are working in your body, we've seen with chiropractic, that if your spine or any joint in your body is out of alignment, over time it's going to create inflammation, it's gonna create aging of that joint. And if you can get that into a better position, it's gonna slow down that aging process. And again, you continually do that over time. It has dramatic impacts on how you age. And, and you can look at somebody. You can look at somebody that's 70 or 80 or 90 years old, 
and they look like they're 50 or 40, and you look at somebody that's 50 and they look like they're 70 or 80 or 90 years old. So it's not just the chronological aging of time, it's how we treat our bodies over time. So if you want more help with this or have questions, please respond to this email, call us, Facebook us, uh, we'll do our best to try to help you with that. But these small things continued over time that are gonna really slow down the aging process of your body. Hey guys, it's Dr. McLean, and you know, I can remember one time I was about eight years old and we had went camping with my family and we've been sleeping in the tent for three or four days, been very hot, and we're playing on the beach and swimming and all the things that you do when you're camping. We had a great time and it was Sunday afternoon and we're driving home, it's 80 or 90 degrees out, we're sweating in the car and of course at that point you just want to get home, you want to take a shower and relax and you still got to unpack all of your tent and things like that. So as we're driving home, my dad was driving, and we come around the corner and here's this car on the side of the road. And this is one of those highways that at times can be very busy, but the majority of times pretty quiet highway. It doesn't get a lot of traffic. So, so we better pull over and see if these people need some help. So you pull over, and it was a very elderly couple. They had a flat tire. It was pretty obvious just physically they weren't going to be able to change this tire by, myself, by themselves. So my dad offered to fix their tire. He changed their tire. But when he went to get the spare on there, they didn't have a spare. So he said, well, I'm gonna take this tire up to the gas station, it's about 10 miles up the road, I'll get it fixed for you and, and I'll bring it back and, and we'll get you on your way. And they were just so thankful. So my dad's got a pretty good sense of humor. As soon as we started driving away, he leaned in the back seat and says, we're not coming back, we're gonna go sell that tire for five bucks at the gas station. And my, my sister just screamed, screamed bloody murder, but of course he was kidding. So we went to the gas station, my dad got the tire fixed. We brought it back, he put it back on their car. And again, they were just, so appreciative, he even paid for it for him. They offered to pay him. He said, oh no, it's on me, don't worry about it. And I can tell you to this day, it had such an impact on me, not because my dad said anything. He didn't say, this is how you take care of other people, this is how you help people out. He didn't have to say anything. He demonstrated that through his actions. So I want you to remember that, especially if you've got kids, but even the people around you, that you can be a beacon of hope for them. You can be an inspiration for them. And I can tell you, one of the biggest compliments that we get as our family and we get this quite regularly is people say, man, your, your, your kids look so healthy, you guys look so healthy, you just, your kids look so happy, you just seem like you've got it all together. And by no means do we have it all together. But I think on the health, edge, on the health regimen, the things that we do, uh, we don't deal with a lot of health issues that a lot of the, I guess, average American does. And as patients in this office, you probably don't as well. So I tell you that because you can be such an inspiration for other people and it's for your kids, they're going to inherit the lifestyle that you are teaching them by your actions. And it doesn't mean that they can't change those as an adult, but you're going to have a huge impact on that. So I want you to know that hopefully that gives you some excitement of you can change your coworkers, your friends, your family by demonstrating first, not telling them what to do, but showing them by getting your spine adjusted, by exercising, by eating healthier, by leading by example. And you can have such an impact on your family and leave a legacy by making these changes. Just like my dad did for me, I always, I always now, and I'm not perfect, but look out for people to help, and especially when we're driving and things like that. So just remember that legacy you can leave, and our health is our most important aspect. So if you can inspire one person to take action, make changes on your health, you will change their life forever. Hey guys, it's Dr. McLean. I'm here with my daughter, Jaden. She's my oldest of three. She's my favorite daughter. I'm your only daughter. Only daughter, that's right. But she's also my favorite daughter. And uh, we were just talking about <clears throat> love hearing inspirational stories. And she's telling about that she's a ballerina. She's been in ballet for six years now, right? She's nine yep. years old. And she read a story about, what was the ballet? What's her name? Heather Whitestone. Heather Whitestone. So why don't you kind of give everybody the synopsis of the story? I, you thought it was a cool story. Well, her name is Heather Whitestone, and when she was really young, she lost her hearing, and her mom enrolled her in dance to try to help her with it, and she grew up to be a really famous dancer. Oh, okay. So you tell me, if I remember right, she was a little bit angry because she could hear when she was born, and then right before she went to school, she lost her hearing. Mm -hmm. So she was a little bit mad and angry that she had lost her healing, hearing. Yes. 
and her mom thought she would adapt a little better if she went to ballet school. Is that is that accurate? Yes. Okay. okay. So when she said that she went on to be a real famous ballerina, I mean, what did she do? She worked really, really hard. And then, so she was with like a touring company? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, she after that, then what else did she do? She was Miss America. Miss America? And now what's she doing now? She's still dancing. She's still dancing. So pretty cool that she overcame these things. And, and we were talking about this too, is how does she, she can't hear, so how does she dance to the music? She can feel the music and she listens to the beats. Wow. So imagine how hard that's got to be is trying to tune into the beats and try to hear that as you as you dance. So what did you, because you were really excited when you read the story, what did you get excited about? Because you, you're a ballerina, but what did you get excited about the story about? Because she accomplished her dreams even though she had a disability. Mm. So it's a good reminder for all of us that we sometimes think, we all have challenges, but sometimes we think we make the challenges bigger than they are. And, and here's a woman that really took it to the next level even though she had this, um, this hearing impairment. And is there anything else that you want to add? Hey guys, it's Dr. McQueen. I was recently looking at some research on headaches, and what they found is that 100% of the time that headaches are either directly caused by the neck, or at least there's some connection to the neck or the cervical spine and these headaches. And I can tell you now, 18 years of practice, I've never had a single person come in here with headaches or migraines or any type of those type of issues. And as long as they follow the rec recommendations, that didn't get some level of relief. The majority of the time the headaches totally go away. But at least they have some level of relief. 100% of the time in 18 years, I think that's pretty amazing. And so this research really confirms that what I found over the years. And what we find is that a lot of times it can just be pressure in these nerves of the neck that can directly cause the headache. It can affect these nerves at the base of the skull that have nerves that go up over the top of the head that can create the headaches. Or the top of the nerves going to the eyes and the ears and that pressure can create the headaches. So so many different things that can cause it, or even oxygen to the tissues. We have pressure at the top here, it decreases oxygen to the tissues, and as a side effect, we develop these headaches. So the headaches are not the problem, they're just the symptom, they're just the end result. But if you've ever had a headache yourself, and, and, and I have myself, I'm very blessed that I haven't had a lot over the years, but when I ever have a headache, I think, man, how can people deal with these on a regular basis? Because when you have these headaches, it's very hard to concentrate, it's hard to focus on your work, the things you're trying to get done. It's hard to be in a good mood. If you have a headache, right? You don't want to hang out with your family. You don't want to necessarily be nice to your kids or your family, even though we try to do that. So they can really affect a lot of different areas of your life. So if you're having these headaches, please let us know. But it was amazing, I, as I shared this research a couple weeks ago, I had so many patients come to me and say, oh yeah, I used to have headaches every single day before I came here. Um, and a lot of them, I had no idea they even had headaches before they came in here because they had some of their issue that was a, more of a pressing issue, so they didn't even share with me that they had headaches. And so we have amazing results. So I want you to really think about the people that you know that are reaching for the aspirin ibuprofen bottle. Maybe you're at work and you see somebody you know, popping those pills. Or if it's a family member taking these prescription drugs, which are very, very dangerous. And please reach out to them. You know, If you're in that position, you'd want somebody to tell you the truth as well, that these are caused from the neck, or at least contributing, and that we can help them. So, Refer them to our office. I can get on the phone with them and answer questions. We can get them some information. But come in so we can check their whole spine, specifically the neck here, and we will be able to help them. And you'll be able to help the quality of life. You'll be able to be the hero for this person and dramatically change the results in their life and their relationships and everything. So please reach out and help those people, and we'll do everything that we can to help them. Hey guys, it's Dr. McLean, and I was recently reading about a very interesting study. And they took this college classroom and they told the students they were going to have a substitute professor. And before the professor came to teach, they gave him a biography about this professor and it told about the professor's background, his experience, his education. But in one sentence was different in these biographies. And so what that means, they took half the class and they gave him the biography and they had one sentence in there that said that this professor was very friendly very outgoing. And then the other half of the students gave the exact same biography, but the one sentence that was different said he was 
cold and not friendly, something to that effect. So the professor came in and he taught the class. All the same students were in the room. And at the end of the class, they surveyed the students to get the response and what they thought about the class. So the students that they gave the biography that said he was friendly and warm, they gave a very positive review. The ones that had the biography that had the cold sentence and are saying he was a cold and not friendly personality, they give a very negative review of the class. Now understand, it was the exact same class, all the students from the same class at the same time, and the difference was just that one sentence. They called that a preframe. And so I started to think about this in terms of our life and, and healthcare and things like that. And so think about that yourself. And a lot of these preframes come from the way that we were raised, the things that we learn in media and in society. So for example, if you believe, which we've been taught about through our lives from the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry, that as we get older, we're gonna lose our health, that we're gonna need prescription drugs, we're gonna have arthritis, and we're gonna slow down, we're gonna get old. If you believe that, if that's your preframe, your actions are gonna follow that. So how hard are you gonna to work to fight against that if you believe that's what your destiny is? Probably not very hard. Or I think about chiropractic. What's your preframe with chiropractic? When you come to get adjusted, or maybe when you first came into our office, did you believe that chiropractic is about back pain and neck pain, or any type of symptoms for that matter? And even though it's effective for those things, that's not really what it's about. Or do you believe, like my family does, that we get adjusted for health? Now it's great if you have back pain or neck pain, you get adjusted and you get some relief, that's awesome. But the way that we do in my family is we get adjusted so our brain can function better and our body can heal itself better. And we know that our chance of cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's and ear infections and sore throat, all those things go down dramatically. So that rather than try to treat it after the effect and try to treat the symptom of the disease, we're trying to be proactive. Now we also eat healthy and exercise and all those things as well. But if you take care of your spine, it handles a lot of those things down the road. So I want you to really think about these preframes in terms of your health and really examine what your preframes are because when you're aware of those things, you can start to treat those things differently. But I can tell you just from a chiropractic standpoint, I want you to really think about when you come in and get adjusted, what's your thoughts? Because if you're treating more of a symptom-based thing, again, I'm not here to judge you, but you'll miss out on the lifestyle aspect. So I want you to think about more of a lifestyle and a healthcare so that you don't need the other things. If you have questions on it, please let us know. We'd love to speak to you about it. Hey guys, it's Dr. McLean. And recently, my family and I went and saw the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. And if you've ever seen the series, there's, I don't know, five or six movies now in this series. And it's always about Captain Jack Sparrow, the main character who's played by Johnny Depp. And they're always trying to achieve some goal. They're trying to get some treasure or achieve something. And along the way, they're always being attacked by their pirates and ghosts and ghost sharks and the redcoats. And there's all this drama. And you know, that's why we like to watch these movies and get entertained because there's a hero that's always trying to achieve something or acquire something or get away from something. And there's all these obstacles they've got to overcome along the way. So that's what our, our brain enjoys that. And there's this quote that says that most men lead quiet lives of desperation. And what happens is in our lives we get caught up in the stability of life, which again sometimes can be good, but we don't have this drama. We don't have this big goal that we're going for. As we go through life, we get kind of into these routines and, and life can get kind of mundane and kind of boring. And again, in certain respects, that's good, but we want to really enjoy life and, and really make it really fun. So when we have this too much of a mundane or this um, boring life, it can create stress. And we start to wonder what it's all about. I think this is where a lot of times people get into this midlife crisis, you know, what is it all about? Why am I doing all these things and not really enjoying life? So I want you to think about that in your cases. How can you create your own hero's journey? It doesn't have to be anything dramatic. You don't have to go on a pirate ship or anything like that, but I don't want you to have this stress of not having the enjoyment from life that you should have. So you've got to create that prize that you're trying to achieve. Maybe it's a, a goal. Maybe it's a health or fitness goal. Maybe it's a new type of lifestyle. Maybe you're an employee right now and you want to own your own business or maybe you want to move into a different line of work or you want to spend your life doing some other things is start that journey out now spend a little bit of time each day getting yourself let's say educated so instead of 
you know, going out for lunch, bring a sack lunch so you have an extra 10, 20 minutes to read a book about how to start your own business or how to make some type of a life's journey and start to move in that direction so you can create the life that you want. You don't want to take what life is giving you. You don't want to accept what life is giving you. You want to create the life that you want. And sometimes we think that that's not possible, but you can really create anything that you want. And you just do a little bit of time, just a little bit of time each day, put in some time, and over time you can create this life that you want. And bring those stress levels down so you can have that hero's journey. You can create what you want in your life and, and just have an amazing life. So if you have questions on it or you want tips on it, please let us know. We'd love to be able to help you. Hey guys, it's Dr. McLean. So imagine that you went to take your car to get service. You're gonna change the oil or change the transmission fluid or get a new air filter in there. And when you pull the car out, the mechanic started asking, well, is it making noise or is it having issues or is it running funny? And you're like, well, no, I just think it's due for these maintenance things. And he said, well, why don't you go home, just wait until it starts to make noise or it has issues or maybe you break down the side of the road and then bring it in, well, maybe we can fix the things then. You know, I wouldn't do the maintenance, wait till something breaks down and we, then we can repair it then. So it might save you a little bit of money today. Or if you had a garden and, and you didn't take care of your garden, you planted the garden, but you never weeded it, you never fertilized, you never watered it or did anything to it. And then it started going very, very badly. It started having weeds all over the place and the plants were looking unhealthy. You said, well, just go in there with some Roundup or some harsh chemical. And although it might kill some of the plants off, we want to kill these weeds off. And, it might make some of the vegetables poisonous when we eat those, but you know it's just too far gone at this point. We've got to do something dramatic. And you probably know where I'm going with this. I mean, that's that sounds crazy. That sounds a little bit insane, but we really do that in a lot of levels with our healthcare, not only with our healthcare system, but just the way that we treat our health. We do things with our health that we would never do in other areas of our life. We wouldn't treat our cars like that. We wouldn't treat our garden like that. We wouldn't do a lot of things like that in other areas of life, but somehow we just wait with our health. We're not proactive. So I know it's a small shift, but why don't you really think about that when it comes to your health and all these little things you can do. They're not big things, really small things you can do on a daily basis to perpetuate health, to put action into your health. You know, you don't wait till your oil is, you know, your, your engine seized up before you go get your oil change. You know, we're supposed to do that every roughly 3,000 miles. And we do that with our cars and we brush our teeth every single day, but we forget to do that with our health, especially our spine and nervous system. So a little bit of time that it takes to come get your spine adjusted or to make a good healthy choice or to do a little bit of exercise each day, you've gotta put that into your schedule, but I'm telling you, the benefits you're gonna achieve are just so huge. So if you decide to not get the oil change, it might save you 30 or 40 bucks, but you do that enough times, pretty soon you're gonna break down the side of the road. It might cost you thousands of dollars and you might lose a whole day because you're waiting for a tow truck or different things like that. And it's out of your control and you're more of an emergency situation. So I know sometimes it's challenging to make these actions or take action steps when you're still feeling good, but you want to create certain regimens in terms of your health and do those on a regular basis. It'll save you so much time, so much money, and the quality of your life will be so much higher every single day, not just when you're having these issues. Hey guys, it's Dr. McClain. Let me share with you a very powerful technique that you can use to get rid of a bad habit or create a new good habit or the combination of both actually very, very easily. And this is what I call the visualization switch. So I'll give you an example for myself. I grew up that every night after supper we would have dessert. Did that for years and years and years so that when I moved out on my own, when I got done eating supper every single night, I would crave dessert because I literally have trained my brain to do this. So I wanted to break that habit. So in this case, here's the way that you could do this. So visualization is a very, very powerful technique and they found that our brains can't tell the difference between something real and something imagined. And think about this, imagine that you're going throughout your day and you see a picture that sparks a memory in your brain, let's say a negative memory, and you literally can get sick to your stomach just by seeing this picture um, or, or you know, creating that image in your mind. So they've actually done this with Olympic athletes. So they, they hook their brains up and their muscles up to these electrodes and have them visualize running a race, for example, 
And even though they weren't physically moving, their muscles were electrically firing in the same sequence it would be as if they were running this race. So your brain can't tell us something different between something that's real and imagined. So we can use this in a very powerful way. So in my case of trying to get rid of this craving for the desserts and stopping this habit of eating desserts after supper, the way that I can do that is, is number one, imagine being in that situation. So I get done eating supper, I'm craving that dessert. And as I'm eating that dessert, I think about myself eating the dessert. And first, number one, step one is I'm gonna negatively associate that dessert with all the things that I wanna avoid. So I think about myself having diabetes or being in the hospital or um, having my family have to come meet me in the hospital or having achy joints or being overweight or whatever negative things that you would associate with eating these desserts or whatever that negative habit might be. So that's step one. Then the second thing is you're gonna recreate that and you're gonna visualize again eating that dessert, but when you're getting ready to eat that dessert, you in your mind switch and you feel yourself having that negative thought, but you feel yourself stopping and doing another habit. So instead of eating this bad dessert, maybe you go out and go for a walk or you go do something enjoyable, but you switch that in your mind. And here's what will happen. You start to do this every single day, maybe a couple times per day. You just visualize this. So just sit on your couch or in a quiet room and visualize this. And what happened for me when I started using these techniques is the first week or so, I didn't really notice anything different. By the fifth or sixth or seventh day, what would happen is I started to do the bad habit. I would recognize that I was doing the bad habit because a lot of times these bad habits are automatic. We don't even realize we're doing them. So I started to recognize in the moment that I was initiating this negative habit. And a lot of times I would still do the negative habit, but I started to recognize it. And after maybe 10 days or 12 days of doing this habit, then I started to catch myself stopping the habit and replacing it with a good habit or doing something different. So it might only take you a week, it might take you three days, it might take you three weeks. It depends on how ingrained the habit is and how much emotion that you add to this. So very, very powerful. You can switch these techniques very, very quickly. And if you have more questions on that, please let us know. And I'd love to hear your feedback if you use it, how it works for you. Hey guys, it's Dr. McClain. I want to talk to you about weekend mentality or being a weekend warrior in a negative sense. And so what I mean by this is, is if you're this type of person is, you know, you go through the week, you don't like your job, you don't like your daily routine, you really don't enjoy much of your weekly activities. And then, but you know, TGIF, thank God it's Friday. And you, um, when I say party, you really enjoy your weekend. You go out to the beach and you go out and have some beers with your friends, or you go play golf or whatever you want to do, and you just love it. And then on Monday, you wake up and go, oh, I got to go to work again and go back to my crappy Monday through Friday week. Now, I'm, I'm being kind of exaggeratory there, but I think a lot of people have that way. They, they just don't love their Monday through Friday, and maybe they love their weekends. They love the freedom that they have. Now, we all have certain obligations in our life that maybe we don't necessarily enjoy doing that we either think we have to do or that we should do. And so first things to recognize, there's nothing that you have to do. You know, we don't have to pay taxes. You may go to jail, you may have some penalties, but you don't have to do that. That's still a choice. And you want to think about that in other areas of life. What do you choose to do and what do you choose not to do? But I want you to start to think about, because I want you really to create the life that you enjoy every single day. Um, how can you start to bring some of the things that you really enjoy in the weekend, if this is you, how can you bring that into the weekend? How can you bring some of the structure from your week into your weekend so you can have more fluidity? Okay, meaning that, let's say, you know, um, during the week you have your obligations of doing laundry or certain chores that you have to do. How can you move some of those things over to the weekend so you have a little more free time during the week so you can do some more fun things during the week so you start to look forward to every single day? Then, if you don't enjoy, let's say, your job, what can you do, number one, to bring more enjoyment to your job so you can enjoy your job more? Or what can you do to create the type of income that you want by doing something that you love? So maybe you love to do art or maybe you love to sing. You can start to do these things. Start out doing these things for free, doing your artwork or teaching people how to sing. So you can develop that skill of teaching it or doing these things. And maybe over time you can create that into a business or you can start to teach your people at work. So again, you have to brainstorm, but really think about what would make every day great for you? What would you enjoy doing? What are you really good at? What do people tell you, man, you're amazing at teaching this or you're amazing at this particular skill. How can you treat, turn that into, let's say a business or spend more time doing that? What do you really enjoy? What gets you really excited that when you do it, 
you feel more energized or feel more happy when you get done doing that versus when you're not doing that. But I want you to really think about that mentality is how can I create it? If that's you that's having this, this weekend mentality, how can you bring in more of that weekend joy into your regular life and how can you move some of that regimen onto the weekend so it's much more fluid and you really can create the life that you want to have every single day because you know we're really on this earth for a very short amount of time in the grand scheme of things. We really want to make it just amazing. You don't want to look back in your life and say, man, I regret not taking that risk or doing that type of thing. So we start doing it today, just a little bit each day, you're going to be able, over time pretty quickly be able to create that life and lifestyle you want or at least start to move into that direction.